Shalom and welcome to Shomer Mitzvot, Torah Observant, a series on practical messianic living and apologetics. I'm the author, Torah teacher Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. Torah observance is a matter of the heart. It always has been and always will be. The Torah proper instructed the people of Israel to love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your resources. This is where Shomer Mitzvot begins, by loving Hashem and accepting Him on His terms. By this, I mean accepting His means of covenant obedience. For today, this means acceptance of Yeshua, His only Son, for Jew and non-Jew alike. Shalom, shalom. You're listening to Live Internet Studies. This is episode number 158. My name is Ariel Ben-Lyman Hanavi. Let's open with a word of prayer. Avinu Malkinu, our Father, our King, thank you, Lord, for bringing us together once again so that we can study your words and so that we can equip ourselves to be ambassadors for your kingdom, uh, building up your name, building up one another, uh, praising you, glorifying you, bringing honor and praise to you, and being in a place where we can help one another, just encourage one another, strengthen one another, pray for one another, uh, just uh, be there for each other, uh, cross the miles, uh, just be a presence. Uh, we bless you, Lord, for these studies. I pray that you'll bring to my recollection the things that I've studied this week, um, and that I pray that you'll be with the students as they join along with me in the study, uh, give them in a large capacity to comprehend the truth, and um, most of all, the things that are truth uh, in your word, I pray that that's what will stick in their spirits. That's what they'll remember. Um, my own words, uh, as clever as they may sound at times, Lord, those aren't all that important. So uh, I ask that uh, you receive all the praise and credit for lives that are changed as a result of this particular ministry. Go with us tonight, be with us tonight, and we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory of Bishim Yeshua. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for joining me week after week. This is Ariel ben Lyman Hana V. I'm a Torah teacher, uh, Torah teacher at Kehilat Tenuva, the Harvest Congregation uh, in Thornton, Colorado. As you can see on my screen right now, we are meeting in person still, no problems that I'm aware of, but we have online sermons. Uh, Mark has begun a new sermon called Torah, the Bedrock of All Scriptures, and uh, you can access the online teachings by clicking the thumbnail that you can see on my screen right now uh, for the YouTube channel there. I also have my own Torah teaching resource at TateSayTorah.com, my own personal Torah teaching website. You can find me online at T-E-T-Z-E. T-O-R-A-H dot com, dot com. And as you can see on my screen, I've got um, lots of resources that you can interact with. These aren't the only things. If you scroll up and down through the page, you can see uh, different uh, features of the website. And I'd love to have you uh, go to my website and take a look around, find out what you like. There's uh, online teachings, there's YouTube videos, there are audio uh, teachings, and... Um, just tell me if there's something there that you have a question about. Send me an email. Let me know what you like. Or if you have questions, let me know, and I'll do my best to field those particular questions. Speaking of YouTube resources, I have my own YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Tate Torah Ministry. It's all one word spelled out there. And uh, as you can see from the thumbnail there, from the uh, the banner, uh, I upload content daily. So if you scroll down into the um, channel itself and click on the videos tab, you'll see that I'm, I'm quite the busy beaver uh, putting out something every day of the week, basically. Um, many of the videos are short enough to be watched in within a five minute time span, but I do have longer videos as well, so as you can see. So um, just avail yourself of all the resources. Do these five things for me real quick. If you do visit my YouTube channel, 
subscribe to the channel and become uh, part of the family. Join the family. Number two, hit the little bell for notifications so that you know when I'm uploading content. Number three, hit the thumbs up if you like the content. Tell me what you like. Number four, leave me comments and questions. And um, again, you can tell me, hey, I like this or I didn't like this um, or I have questions about this. Why do you teach that? Or um, do you have any teachings on this and that? And I'll see what I can do. And then lastly, there's usually a little arrow that you can click that'll let you share the, the uh, content with your friends and family on social media. And that way, um, everyone else can join in on the resources. Okay. These are the live internet studies brought to you week after week uh, from my computer to your computer. Let me give you some of the brief details that we're going to be looking at. This is episode number 158, as I mentioned earlier. This uh, meeting date for the recording is October 9th, 2021. That's the USA date, basically. We meet Saturday afternoons from 5 p.m. to approximately 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. The hour-long study is broken up into two 30-minute segments. The first segment is dedicated Romans 14 Unplugged Feast and Fast and Food, oh my, part 74 tonight. We'll be doing a lot of review so we can get kind of an overview of what's going on in the study. Segment two is given over to the apologetic portion known as Exploring the Shema, Discussions on the Issues of Trinity. We're in paper three of three papers, Who or What is the Holy Spirit? And we're starting in part 90 tonight. And there'll be two, um, I'm sorry, there'll be a YouTube video that we're going to watch um, entitled, What Day is the Sabbath? Do Christians Have to Observe the Sabbath Day? If I can f uh, get that all worked out and get the, the uh, uh, bugs worked out, we'll make sure we can watch that. I've been having problems with my video uh, recording lately, but we'll see what we can do. These live Skype classes are brought to you via Skype. As you can see the banner on my screen, if you go to my website at Tetsu Torah and um, click on the Live Internet Studies link across the very, very top, it'll bring you to this page, scroll down into the page, look for the blue Skype banner, and if it is on a Saturday afternoon, then you can join us by clicking the blue Skype banner link right there, and that'll just open up Skype on your browser, and, and that's the easiest way to join us. It does all the work for you. Uh, if you do go to my website, just um, take a moment to scroll all the way to the very, very bottom of the website to that black section where you see some Hebrew writing, and uh, take a moment to pray about uh, supporting my ministry. If the Lord is laying it on your heart to help me out financially, this is the way you can do it. There's a little yellow donate button down there at the bottom of my website, and uh, that way you can donate um, securely to my ministry. And as I always say, be blessed as you seek to be a blessing to others. All right, without further ado, let's jump into Romans 14 Unplugged, Feasts and Fast and Food. Oh my. And um, we're just about near the end of the study, we're really, as I scroll to the table of contents, like you can see on my screen right now, let me blow that up real quick. I like to have that nice and big. Um, as you can see the table of contents on my screen right now, we're actually in section number um, 15, where it says, how can we make for peace and mutual building? And we're really ready for 16, the conclusions. But before we jump into the conclusions, which is really, really short, like two paragraphs, I want to go back, take about 10 minutes, maybe even 15 minutes, to go back through the study as an overview, since it's been quite a while, um, and sometimes you can get lost in the forest because of the trees. So let's go back um, through some of the points and remind ourselves where we've come from. This will kind of give us a context as we take a look at the um, conclusions that we've come up with so far. The study itself, uh, if I look at the table of contents, you can see it's broken up into 18 different uh, segment numbers. I'll just read down through each one of those numbers and tell you what we talked about and uh, some of the points that were highlighted. In the introduction, in the background and historical audience, which is um, section number one, you can call them chapters if you want or paragraphs if you want. In the introduction and background audience, I think I'll just click on it, um, we learned from um, quite a few resources that basically Paul is writing to a group of believers in Rome that he's never visited. He's writing it roughly around the late fifth, mid to late 50s of his time in the first century. And um, historically, uh, the church that he's writing to the church groups are largely composed of Jews and Gentiles with a Gentile majority, Jewish minority. And part of the reason because 
part of the reason behind the um, majority of Gentiles is likely due to what we read in history is the um, the uh, expulsion, the Claudia, Emperor Claudius' expulsion from Rome of Jews in that day, probably earlier in that uh, particular uh, century, so or in the, earlier in that decade, so earlier, maybe like maybe late 40s or early 50s, something sometime around that. Uh, it's hard to pin down. Even historians say it's hard to know uh, with all the f- f- fragmented historical accounts. Um, but what we've come to learn as we um, looked at this particular part of my commentary that impacts our uh, appreciation for the Book of Romans is that um, the Jewish people had been at least at this time, had been forced to be kicked out of Rome. How many of them were expelled? We don't know for certain. Luke tells us in the book of Acts that, um, I'm sorry, in the in his uh, self-titled book, the book of Luke itself, or is it Acts? No, I think it is Acts. I keep getting that, that confused since he wrote both books. Sometimes I can't remember where, which resources fall where. It is Acts uh, 18, 1 and 2, like you can see on my uh, screen right there. Um, he tells us that they were um, expelled from Rome. In fact, we can read this verse here. Acts 18, 1 through 4 out of the ESV says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Verse 2, And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. In verse 3, And because he was of the same trade, right, uh, tent maker or working with um, leather or something like that, he stayed with them and work, worked worked. Uh, for they were tent makers by trade. For and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So this is Luke's historical account of the um, of the expulsion. Notice in verse um, two, Luke records that um, uh, Claudius commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Now uh, the text says all the Jews. Claudius had commanded all the Jews, but when we corroborate what Luke wrote with what other historians have also uh, left for us, and the few that we have, Suetonius and and some of the other uh, writers, uh, Josephus and things like that, um, we end up with a, a possibility that Claudius's decree either didn't take full effect, meaning um, not everyone followed through with what he said, or that maybe only a small group of Jews were kicked out at the time. Meaning, when it says all the Jews, it may, be, it may have meant all the Jews of that particular region or of a particular town or um, province or something like that. Or it could have just meant um, all the Jews of that particular faction who were deemed troublemakers at the time. Um, maybe enter. So, how wide scope, how wide uh, uh, impacting. Uh, Emperor Claudius' decree was, is important for the letter because it sets a kind of a tone, uh, as we understand, you know, and this, this news would have traveled all the way back to Paul because he, staying in Corinth at the time, met up with these Messianic Jews, Priscilla and Aquila, and they would have given him a first-hand account of what happened. So, for whatever reasons, we at least know that some of the Messianic Jews were also swept up in the degree, in the, um, the decree to get out. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila obviously left. Maybe they left on their own accord. Maybe they were forced to leave. We don't know for sure. But, um, uh, you know, they, it seems to me that they, they probably didn't have a choice in the matter, at least according to what Acts tells us here in Acts chapter 18. We do know that Acts is reliable. The, the, the scriptures are trustable, uh, even historically. So, I'm not doubting that the um, uh, expulsion took place, so don't get me wrong. What I'm simply saying is that there's a possibility, given uh, what we read in, his- in historical accounts, that um, there may not have been as widespread uh, expulsion as we often like to think or have been told. And if that's the case, then there was a strong enough Jewish presence there that Paul could appeal to the Jewish I'm sorry, to the Gentiles, to continue to connect with the Jewish communities that were left in Rome. Particularly, we do know this, um, The uh, as we go on to read in my own commentary, Claudius himself was murdered in AD 54. I think historians say it was probably his wife that murdered him, stabbed him in the back or something like that with a dagger. And um, thus his decree, as we say, as I read in my commentary, thus bringing his decree to an end and allowing the Jews to return. So that's good news. They returned to Rome in great numbers. And since Paul 
went on to actually visit Rome a short five years later, so approximately, I say in my commentary, AD 60, then I think it is of no small importance that once he got to Rome, he met with um, non-Christian Jewish synagogue leaders to discuss his particular trial. And we can read about that in Acts chapter 28 right um, here in my commentary. So, in um, conclusion to that section, why was it important for us? Um, just jump back up to the top of the commentary. Why is that part important for our particular study in the introduction? It's because if Paul wrote to a community of Gentiles that were predominantly Gentiles, that part, there's no question there. We don't have to use history. We can use the internal evidence from the book of Romans at the very end where he just lays out all of his greetings and use that as a snapshot of the congregation. There's mostly Gentile um, makeup there. No problem. And that's a good thing that we have a lot of Gentiles who are hearing the gospel and being brought into um, uh, the Messianic communities. But what impacts our study and appreciation for how much Paul is going to appeal to the Gentiles to continue to stay connected to their Jewish brothers is kind of affected by how many Jews we think are still in the congregation. Is he really feeding into what we would today re refer to or recognize as the, the split between the church and the synagogue? In other words, if the Jews got kicked out of Rome and there was really no strong Jewish presence, why would Paul really even worry or want or in, in, uh, imply that the Gentile Christians should connect to Jewish communities, stay connected to them, reaching out to them, fellowshipping with them to some degree? Uh, all of that is a, it forms the background to, is Paul teaching a law-free gospel? Is he teaching Gentile Christians to kind of, um, what do we say, strike out on their own and uh, you know figure it out on their own outside of the existing uh, people group of God known as Israel? Has God replaced Israel with the Gentile Christians? Uh, those are all questions that get brought up as we look at the background and historical audience to this letter. My conclusions that I came to as I look at point number two was we may not know exactly how many people were there uh, because of uh, fractured and fragmented historical accounts, but you Using the resources that I have come uh, to appreciate, the Mystery of Romans uh, book that I've been using by Mark Nanos, his suggestion is that in the end, it's like there's a strong pro possibility and even a strong probability um, that all the Jews didn't just pack up and leave in the short space of time that uh, Emperor Claudius said, get up and get out wasn't really practical. Um, there were lots of uh, uh, barriers or lots of um, hurdles or um, uh, things that would have prevented them from just, you know, uh, uh, you know, getting up and go taking off, um, you know, settling all their accounts in such a short, a short time, um, packing up and, you know, moving out. It wasn't like they could all just hop on a train and or hop on the next flight out of Rome. It didn't work that way, as we, I'm sure you're probably aware. So there's good reason to um, suspect historically and suggest that Paul was writing to, and this is the part I want you to, to latch on to, so listen up, that Paul was writing to a group of Gentile Christians and reminding them to stay connected to the Jewish communities, if at all possible. Yes, the synagogues were growing increasingly antagonistic against Gentile Christians for whatever reasons, uh, for their Messianic claims, for their membership claims in Israel, for the, the, the religious differences of over who the Messiah was, right? The, 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 the conflict over, you know, who Jesus was to the Jewish people, that type of stuff. Yes, that's true, but Paul didn't want, as I understand Romans, Paul didn't want the Gentile Christians to think of themselves as separated from the family of Abraham. To be sure, if we read the internal evidence, even in the book of Romans, like say chapter 4, the theology behind what Paul is trying to teach the Gentile Christians, and it culminates in chapters 9 through 11 of Romans, the what Paul is really trying to get them to, to understand, they, the Gentiles, is that they are part of the same olive tree family that the Jewish people are already part of, even if the Gentiles exist on a place in the tree that's special to God because of their faith in Messiah, known as the remnant of Israel. They're grafted into Israel, and they become partakers with Israel, not overtakers. 
of Israel. That's the important fact that I think Paul wants to establish. To be sure, the evidence of Paul's um, uh, uh, reliance upon the different parts of the Tanakh that support his arguments about who Jesus is and uh, who Abraham is and um, the uh, uh, the importance of, of knowing uh, Yeshua as your personal Messiah and the pardon of your sins, uh, fellowshipping of the Holy Spirit and things like that. All of those details theologically are rooted in the Tanakh. That's the Bible that Paul used, the Old Testament. How could Paul have imagined his Gentile Christians to even believe his line of reasoning if they had no connection to the scriptures of Israel at all? If they were separated from the synagogue communities? It's a very strong logical argument, in my opinion. Paul appeals to the scriptures of Israel over and over again. I, I, I think one, um, I think quite a few uh, authors have recognized um, Bible commentaries that he uses uh, quotes from the book of uh, from the Tanakh itself um, more than any other book and so this, there's a reason why this is called his magnum opus right his great theological treatise and um, how can he support his arguments if he believes that the Gentile Christians have thrown out their connection to to Israel and the Israel scriptures and do we want to imagine for a moment that those synagogue communities just handed over their Torah scrolls to the Gentile Christians and said hey guess what we're leaving. Can you guys take care of these for us while we're gone? Or we decided to sell these to you because we don't have any room to pack them? No. <laughs> Torah scrolls are one of the most precious items to Jewish people, have always been and always will be. And so you can imagine that they found a way to smuggle those out or take them with them. They weren't prevented, as far as we can tell, from keeping their belongings when Claudius said, get up and get out. He didn't say, leave all that you have behind, as far as we know. So they, it's unlikely they would have been handing those scrolls over to Gentile Christians and said, hey, you guys can have these. Um, that means Means the Gentile Christians didn't really have anything to rely on unless they still had connections to some Jewish people who were still around in Rome. And so I suppose that there was still a strong enough Jewish community there that Paul could appeal to the Gentile Christians to stay connected to those synagogue communities, particularly also with the task of reaching out and witnessing to them. In the scope and style of the study, uh, part two, I outlined some bullet points. Let me just read some of those for you and um, tell you what we uh, came up with. We had bullet point, uh, which covered verse 14, 1, and we asked the question, who are the weak in faith? We've come to the conclusion that there's two strong possibilities. Either the weak in faith are Jewish people who believe in Jesus, they're Christians, and yet they're still holding to the ceremonial parts of the law like Sabbath, kosher keeping, festival keeping, things like that. And because of those um, preferences, they're labeled weak by the strong Gentile Christians who also believe in Jesus, but have... Um, uh, how shall we say, rejected any uh, urge to fall back into any vestiges of Torah keeping. That's the popular way of outlining this particular part of Paul's letter when he talks about weak in faith. What we came to understand, however, in my study, is that there are alternate ways of understanding who the weak in faith are. And one of the ways that I'm um, running with, I think there's some strong traction to this particular possibility, is Mark Nano's perspective, and I'll put something on the screen here in post-production, you can see these in bullet point faction as well. Mark Nano's is proposing that the weak in faith could likely be non-Messianic Jews. So those Jewish people who were there in Paul's day, they didn't believe in Jesus as Messiah, but they still formed part of the faith communities that Paul recognized in that time in Rome. Faith in God, loyal to God's Torah, but not yet quite decided who Jesus is. This would put them in close proximity with the Gentile Christians, particularly in places where they can discuss the identity of who Jesus really was to Israel and to the Jewish people. And having a loyalty to Torah is also a good thing because, remember, Paul was a lifelong Torah keeper himself. 
He wasn't a Torah breaker. Uh, he was a Torah keeper. And so uh, working with Jews who were also Torah keepers would have just been easy and natural for Paul to witness to them. So that's what we learned in Week in Faith. In verses 2 through 4, we asked the question, what is the contrast between anything and vegetables? Remember, it's Paul himself who's bringing up these issues in his letter. We've got this conflict between the weak and the strong. It's at least, at the very least, we can say that it's a conflict between a Jewish portion of the community and the Gentile portion. Whether or not those Jews were Messianic or not, again, that's open to debate. And if you're not convinced, then I'm fine with that. I'm not going to be all up in arms if you don't uh, uh, take the perspective that I'm presenting that the weak in faith were actually non-Messianic Jews. I understand that's a bit of a radical departure from what you've probably been taught in your local uh, church setting or seminary or uh, Bible bookstore uh, commentaries and things, or even online or what your own Messianic uh, Torah teachers and rabbis are probably telling you. It's 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 radically different. I understand, and it takes a little while to kind of work through the details. But at the very least, Paul is definitely addressing an issue where. We have some table fellowship uh, disagreement going on. And we have one group separating themselves from eating all foods and another group, well, all types of foods, and another group um, saying, well, it's okay to eat everything. And part of this discussion, and this is ongoing throughout the, this particular chapter, part of the real issue is the nature of the um, ritual defilement of certain foods. And this would squarely put it back into the lap of Jewish sensitivity. So we at least can say that there was a strong enough Jewish presence in the community in Rome that these particular issues would have been brought up. Religious Jews would naturally, and I'll put a little slide up to show this as well, would naturally want to avoid any type of questionable food sources. Uh, just like today, religious Jews try to keep kosher to the best of their ability, avoiding um, shopping in, in a Gentile supermarkets, uh, preferring instead to shop in uh, Jewish-owned supermarkets uh, because they know where the uh, sources of the meat comes from and they're um, comfortable with the uh, procedures that it took to you know, uh, slaughter the meat. Uh, they're they're uh, assured that no um, blessings were made to pagan ide uh, 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 identities or uh, pa pagan idol idols or, or uh, entities or things like that. You know, in the first century, there was a lot of paganism in, uh, around, the, uh, in, in, especially in ancient Rome as well, but a lot of paganism that made the Jews very uncomfortable. And so shopping for meat in the common Gentile marketplace, especially when it's common knowledge that much of that meat may have originated in a pagan temple, you know, it was food that was offered to idols before it was sold in the meat market, um, that made a lot of Jews uncomfortable. And so the default um, perspective in Paul's day, if you're a religious Jew and you wanted to keep kosher, oftentimes was simply to default into vegetarianism and avoid meat altogether. So this kind of fits the context of uh, between eat, eating anything and eating vegetables. Also, we looked at the very real probability that Paul was teaching Gentile Christians to keep kosher to the best of their ability, meaning eat anything doesn't meet Eat mean um, Paul's instructing Gentile Christians to chow down on that ham sandwich or that shellfish, uh, you know, like I mentioned, what that shrimp crawdad or that uh, uh, shrimp gumbo or something like that, um, lobster beesk, uh, as I kept, uh, you know, naming off these uh, humorous uh, food choices. In other words, if Paul kept kosher his entire life and he taught a uh, a message to Gentiles that they should emulate him, just like he emulates Messiah, well then it's very likely that he's teaching Gentiles to keep kosher as well. And I firmly believe that this would have put them in a place where they could be more received in Jewish circles. So the contrast between anything and vegetables is still within the scope of a Torah-based discussion of anything meaning meat versus, versus vegetarian, not anything as to say all food and anything that we moderns today call food. All right. In uh, next bullet point down, we talked about in verses five through nine of Romans fourteen, are Christians free to worship God any day of the week? We already know that there's a verse where Paul says that one man uh, considers one day special, whereas one man considers all days alike. I'm kind of paraphrasing, and it's common 
knowledge by today's Christian standards that the um, interpretations that's, that are preferred by Christians is that Paul is setting up a scenario where Gentiles are allowed to keep Sunday worship as their special day and Jews are allowed to keep Saturday. And it's almost kind of like a, on a vote-based uh, decision model where uh, they can take a vote in their communities and see who wants to do what. And it seems to be that Paul is allowing the groups to just come to a decision uh, amicably, right, as long as they don't come to blows over their decisions, um, kind of like um, – um, you know, we have agreed to disagree if that's the case, but we're going to go and start our own community over here where we're going to worship on this particular day. And it's almost as if Paul is endorsing that. But if we study more carefully, I firmly believe that what Paul is likely addressing is not Sabbath versus Sunday. That's way too early at this time to bring that decision-making um, topic in, onto the table. Uh, it's what we, I would call anachronistic. The Sabbath to Sunday debates aren't going to show up for uh, probably a few more decades, if not even closer, maybe even to a couple hundred years later. In other words, by the first century, it's more probable, at least we can tell from history and even from the internal biblical evidence, that the Gentile Christians were practicing religious holidays that were very similar to the Judaisms of Paul's day as well. So Sabbath keeping wouldn't have been a problem for that. If that's the case, then what days are Paul what is what days are Paul is Paul referring to? He's probably talking about fast days. Something that's non um, obligatory. It's not laid down black and white in scripture which days you have to fast on. And thus, it is known historically that Gentiles were fasting on certain days. The Christians were bringing these fast days. You can read about this in the surviving documents known as the Didache, which is a, a Christian work. It's not necessarily a Jewish work. Um, but you can also read about it in the surviving uh, Jewish um, uh, literature like the Mishnahs and the, and the Talmuds, the Gemaras, and things like that about you know when Pharisees fasted and how, how often and what days of the week and the power struggles were still there. True, uh, you know you know the Jewish communities and the Gentile communities they had some disagreements, and so Paul's going to step in and say that at least as brothers and that's what we're going to look at in the next bullet point as brothers and Messiah we need to settle our differences peaceably. Yes, some people are going to choose a different fast day than others, but that doesn't give them the right to judge one another based on the disagreement of which days they're fasting on. And this fits the overall context of the food topics that are laced throughout the chapter better than if we were talking about a Sabbath versus Sunday. Amen? Amen. Next topic that we looked at in our um, study is Romans 14, 10 through 13. And I asked the question, who is the brother? And this kind of relates to the background look at was there a sizable amount of Jewish people there in the community that Paul could appeal to the Gentile Christians to stay connected to them as brother covenant members. That's why I asked the question, who is the brother? Paul uses the word brother in the New Testament most often to refer to brother Christians. This is true, and I want you to also think of it that way, just like you've always been taught. Brother most often meets Christians. However, the point I brought up in this part of my study is that there are times when, in a, in a, in a smaller context, brother can mean brother covenant member, brother Israelite, brother um, Abrahamic son or daughter. Remember, Romans chapter 4, along with Galatians chapter 3, outlines Gentiles being brought into the Abrahamic family, along with the existing Jewish people who had also placed their faith in Messiah. But from a broader context, the Abrahamic family still includes unbelieving Jews on the natural level. Paul does not, I believe, want Gentile Christians to consider unbelieving Jews as no longer their brothers. Yes, they're still brothers on a different covenant level. Their relationship with God is not quite complete 
because they haven't placed our faith in Jesus, but that doesn't change the relationship to the larger covenant community known as Israel. In other words, we're back to square one again. Does Paul want the Gentile Christians in Rome to stay connected to the larger synagogue communities of Israel and consider that greater national Israel, even though she's stumbling and uh, uh, blinded, is nevertheless still their covenant brothers at that covenant level uh, at the natural level, uh, meaning uh, they're natural-born Abrahamic sons and daughters. Uh, they're not spiritual Jews yet. They're not Messianic Jews. Uh, therefore, not, they're not Messianic brothers. But they are still covenant brothers uh, in, in, in the sense that Gentiles have their place alongside them on the Abrahamic family tree known as the olive tree. So that's where we got some uh, some mileage out of that word brother, the Greek word Adelphi, Adelphoi or Adelphos in the singular or the plural. Uh, moving along, uh, the next bullet point, chapter 14 verses 14 through 18. We're moving along through kind of an overview, a summary as we're working our way to the conclusion of um, what we've learned so far. I asked the question, what exactly does nothing is unclean in itself imply? Paul seems to be teaching the Gentile Christians that they don't have to worry about what God has already outlined in Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 14 as kosher and non-kosher foods. Remember, Israel was given a list of how to identify animals that were allowed for eating purposes. And uh, this is based on characteristics, you know, the way animals behaved, or sometimes it was based on... Um, uh, certain uh, physical characteristics, like did they have a split hoof, or did they chew the cud, or um, you know things like that. And the bottom line is that we had differences of opinion as to what we can and cannot eat earlier on in Paul's day. Obviously, Gentiles who were not raised in a social setting where they were taught to avoid certain foods, when they were brought into close proximity with Jews, there was there's naturally going to be some disagreement, some friction, some uh, even some heated debates. I like to say a food fight is bound to break out, right? Pun intended there, food fight. So when Paul comes along and says, nothing is unclean in itself, is he really saying that the food laws in Leviticus don't matter anymore? Because we read about clean and unclean in Leviticus all over the place. Well, surprisingly, if we look at the Greek terms, and we did look at that, right, koinos and akathartos and things like that, we find that it's unlikely that Paul is telling the Gentile Christians that they no longer have to keep kosher. It's more likely that he's addressing the food that was sold in the common marketplaces, which had gone under the, the adjective uh, akathartos, I'm sorry, not a kathartos, but a koinos, meaning it was handled by everyone. It was profane. It was um, it was uh, unholy. It was unsanctified. It was undedicated. Uh, and therefore, even chicken or allowable food, beef, could be rejected by a religious Jew if it if the origin was questionable. And so Paul's really come along, I believe, in telling uh, the Gentile Christians nothing really, even if it was sold, even if it was uh, offered up to food uh, to idol, it's not really off limits as long as God has already given the, the green light, the thumbs up, to eat it in the Bible. As long as the Torah says it's it's a permissible animal to eat, then don't worry too much about the pagan uh, pollution, the pagan. Um, uh, uh, what would we call um, uh, the, uh, the the contact with with pagan sources uh, and things like that? The 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 infestation of paganism, uh, because Paul's going to go on to teach in, Cor in Corinthians uh, that pagans really are nothing. I'm sorry, uh, uh, idols are really nothing. Um, yes, they are. They're representations of demonic entities, but in Messiah, you need not fear them. No, you shouldn't be participating in pagan ceremonies. No, you didn't, needn't flagrantly um, uh, flaunt your freedom in Messiah and say that it's okay to, to run around in those circles anymore as Gentile believers. But when it comes to food, eat whatever sold in the marketplace without raising questions of, of, of origin. I'm kind of paraphrasing a verse out of the book of uh, Corinthians. Maybe I'll flash it on the screen in post-production. So I think that's the better way to understand that nothing is unclean in itself verse. And then from there, we move down into verse 19. Uh, how can we make for peace and mutual building? That brings us right back to where we're at 
uh, in, in our current discussion. Paul needs the Jewish and Gentile factions within the communities of Rome to work towards a common understanding. And even though they're going to have these differences between food, even though they're going to have these differences between special days, even though they're going to have their differences and challenges over who Jesus is as the Messiah, nevertheless, in the end, there is a strong reason, a very um, important reason why they should be working together. And this is what I talked about over the last few weeks. Paul recognizes, and listen up, Paul recognizes that Jew and Gentile have been brought together in Messiah to uh, showcase and highlight the foundational truth of the gospel message itself. The gospel which was preached to Abraham so long ago, that in your seed all the nations of the families will be blessed. All the families and the nations, the peoples of the nations will be blessed, Abraham. This is given way back in Genesis chapter 12. The gospel is that Jew and Gentile can form the people of God. This part of the gospel, this feature of bringing Jew and Gentile together to form the uh, family of God, the family of Abraham, this was hidden to Israel. That's why it's called the mystery of the gospel in Ephesians chapters 2 and 3 and following. Go back and read chapter, Ephesians chapter 3 on your own one of these times. It's a, it's a great homework assignment. Paul recognizes that as the um, apostle to the Gentiles, he's got a mission not just to teach Jesus to the Gentiles, but to continue to ex- uh, to express the truth that the Gentiles are one with the people group of God without having to become Jews in the process. What we've learned as I'm breaking, uh, finish uh, summarizing in this part of my letter, what we've learned is that what really makes for mutual uh, peace and mutual building, let me just uh, jump, jump right into that part of my um, study so we jump into the conclusions. What we really learn is that it's when Jews and Gentiles are worshiping together, uh, recognizing God and Messiah and the scriptures and the importance of Israel and the importance of the church and the body of Messiah and the need to, to forgive one another and love one another despite our differences. That is what makes for peace and mutual building in the truest sense of the word, relying on the spirit of God to strengthen our communities despite our differences keeping us glued together, praying not just for one another, but with one another, welcoming one another despite the differences, and genuinely loving the other even though they're different. That's what makes for peace and mutual building. So um, let's look at these conclusions real quick. Um, uh, Let me read down through this, and this will poise us. Uh, ready for uh, next week. I th- this is very short, so I think I can read through this. This is the conclusion that we've been kind of building to, at least in this section. And so I say my commentary, while it was natural that Paul would expect both spirit-filled Jews and Gentiles to continue to have their socio-religious differences and challenges, particularly in regards to food and table fellowship, Nevertheless, because both Jew and Gentile have been brought together in the salvific plans of the kingdom of God, right? They have not been separated. The split between the church and the synagogue has not taken place yet. It will eventually, and much to Paul's disappointment, the two mutual groups, the ethnicities, the Jews and Gentiles, they continued with the shared and heated animosity and the enmity, even though Jesus broke that wall down like you read about in Ephesians chapter 2 and studied it, and we're going to look at it in my liturgy tonight, even though there's reason for us to fight against a natural urge to, to distance ourselves from people who are different, nevertheless, history is the spoiler, and we know that the church and the synagogue eventually became fractured and separated, right? Even though that did happen, Paul nevertheless expected each person in this day to live by the power of the flesh. Nope, that's not what he said. He expected them to live by the power of human ingenuity and, 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 and um, uh, uh, political persuasion. Nope, that's not what he wrote either. Go back and read his letters very carefully. Over and over again, 
Paul doesn't appeal to the flesh. He doesn't appeal to the old man. He does not appeal to the fleshly appetites or the ethnicities or even the, the, the gender roles and the social statuses, you know, male, female, slave, free, Jew and Gentile, things like that. He doesn't appeal to those things. What does he appeal to? He appeals over and over to the power of a changed life, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Ruach Kodesh, in order that the, quote, deeds of the flesh, end quote, might be, quote, put to death. The jealousy, the strife, the envyings, the backbiting, the the um the mocking, the the judgmental attitudes that we read about in Romans chapter 14 here. All of that is the deeds of the flesh. All of that needs to die. Go back and read very carefully. Here's your homework assignment. Go back and read Romans chapters. Start and write, say, chapter 5, and don't stop to get to chapter 8. So 5, 6, 7, 8. Read that as a set. It's not a long read, you know, four chapters. Um, read that on your uh, on your own uh, this week. And just catch the import of how Paul is describing vividly that the old man in Christ has died, and our propensity to sin must be suppressed, and it must be done not under our own power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. We must say no to the flesh. We must say yes to Yeshua through the power of the Spirit. We must walk by the Spirit, and therefore we will um, defeat the uh, the deeds of the flesh. We'll subject the the old man and the old nature, and over and over again, that's what Paul's going to appeal to. We've got to live in accordance to, with um, the new creation that we are. We've been born again by the precious blood of Messiah Yeshua, both Jew and Gentile, brought into this family together by Messiah sacrifice and it is only through um, uh, walking in the power of the spirit and continuing to turn away from sin yes it's difficult but you can do it by the power of God you have been given not just a new um, position in Messiah forensically right old man new man but you've been given a new proclivity right you've been given the power to say no to sin but it's a partnership between you and God. You've got to do it, and God will be doing it in you. Is it you doing it on your own? No. But is it you making the decisions? Yes. Understand what I'm saying here? It is free will, but it is also God's will. So it's a partnership between you and the Spirit of God working together to bring about the sanctification of the new man, of the um, of the old and new, uh, to cleanse you and to make you and turn you into a usable vessel uh, for the kingdom of God. So Paul expects each person, Jew and Gentile, in the uh, uh, communities of Rome, and we're closing with this, to live by the power of the Holy Spirit in order that the deeds of the flesh might be put to death and that they might, quote, walk in newness of life, right? The old man has died. That's why we read through the Ephesians passage that we're going to look at in our liturgy again. We, Gentiles and Jews, have been brought into a new place in God's eyes, a new place in God's kingdom. Forensically, we have been changed. We've been um, rescued from the kingdom of darkness that we were raised in and born in and brought into the kingdom of light and life and Messiah. And so we've got to make this choice with the Spirit's help and with the help of the community that we're a part of to walk in that newness of life. And I think I'll stop there in my commentary, and we'll pick this up next week and bring it to a close, this part of my commentary. We'll make this lengthy quote from Burns uh, on Romans 14, 19. That'll be appropriate for my study. But that'll do it for now. For Romans 14 Unplugged, Feast and Fast and Food, oh my. Let's turn to exploring the Shema, discussions on the issues of Trinity. We are in paper three, who or what is the Holy Spirit, and we're in this um, section where we're talking about um, the Spirit of God versus the Spirit of Messiah versus the Holy Spirit, and, and how there's an overlap of the, um, the use of the Spirit in the Bible. In a very broad sense, we could say that the Holy Spirit is God's Spirit. But as we begin to read passages uh, as they're um, revealed to us in the pages of the New Testament, we begin to realize that the Holy Spirit is a separate person in and of himself. He can be sent by, this, by God to um, accomplish God's will. 
but yet at the same time, he's very God. Um, and this stretches our understanding of God, um, especially when we're talking about a comparison of Unitarian versus Trinitarian. We left off last week talking about how it is very, very unlikely that the Holy Spirit is merely an impersonal force like electricity. And you can see on my screen I say, Surely an impersonal force like electricity cannot be grieved or lied to, nor is the ordinary to describe humans as capable of having fellowship with an impersonal force of power. It's no secret that um, many non-Trinitarian groups, I keep mentioning the Unitarians, the Christadelphians, Iglesia de Cristo, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, some many Oneness Pentecostals, uh, people groups, um, even um, um, monotheistic Jews, their understanding of the Holy Spirit is limited to those verses that describe the power of God coming upon a person or overtaking a person or, or something like that. And so it's easy to suspect that the Spirit of God is just this force of energy. The Jehovah's Witnesses that I, I'm fond of picking on are most famous for outlining this perspective in their translations, the New World Translation, where they use impersonal pronouns like it. And I've demonstrated over and over again that that's not intellectually honest uh, because there are places where Yeshua himself, in John chapter 15, 16, and 17, uses personal pronouns like he to describe the Holy Spirit, and it shows up in the Greek as a personal a masculine pronoun. And yet, um, over and over again, uh, groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses still think that the Holy Spirit is an it. No, stop thinking like that, all right? Uh, the Holy Spirit is not an it. He's a he. Also, he's not merely the Spirit of God. He's not merely God's own personal spirit. As we're going to see in other places of the Bible, he is a separate person of the triune nature of God. God uh, reveals himself in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's hard for us to, to understand exactly how that all works together. But let's pick up our study tonight and uh, keep going in this particular sec segment. I say in my commentary, and in respect to the risen Messiah. So now we're talking about... God, who is a spirit, who nevertheless sends his spirit to accomplish certain tasks, and this um, um, impacts us as a separate person of the spirit, meaning God the person is sending the person of the spirit, so God is sending himself, but it is a separate person known as the third person of the Trinity. And yet, at the same time, there are certain passages that we're going to read where the Holy Spirit is equated as the Spirit of Messiah. How does that work out? Is it the Spirit of God or is it the Spirit of Messiah? Is it God's Holy Spirit that's filling Messiah? Is it the Messiah's own Spirit that's within us? There are places in the, in the Apostolic Scriptures in Romans where Paul talks about the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Messiah and, he, and the Holy Spirit, and he just overlaps these identities to give us the conclusion that we're talking about one entity known as a Spirit, yet in the mystery of it all, it is God the Spirit, it is uh, Christ the Spirit, and it is the Holy Spirit. He is, I should say. I'm saying it. All right, so in my commentary, I say, in respect to the risen Messiah, the Bible also effortlessly overlaps the Spirit of God with the Spirit of Christ in some references. And I, I say in my commentary, I mean admittedly, in order for the Spirit of an eternal God, such as the Father, viz. His eternal Holy Spirit, to be equated with, for example, the Spirit of His Son. So we, we have this overlap. Follow with me, okay? Just don't don't get lost yet. In order for this to take place, right, the Spirit of Son Messiah Yeshua, and for in order for this to happen, the human being known as the Messiah would have to, in some mysterious way, in my understanding, at the very least, be intimately connected with the being of God the Father Himself. Now, of course, we know in the hypostatic union between God the Father and God the Son, God the Son sharing the same full deity nature as God the Father. Remember, we believe as, as Orthodox uh, small o Trinitarians that the Word made flesh mentioned in John 1.1 1, 1, uh, in John 1, uh, 14 and John 1, 18, this word became flesh and we know his name as Yeshua. 
the incarnation allows for us to uh, believe and teach a biblical principle that's difficult to articulate, but nevertheless, we affirm it, that Jesus is full deity, and yet at the same time, he's fully humanity. He's truly deity, and he's truly human. Well, if, like we're going to read about in the book of Romans, um, the spirit of Messiah can dwell within us, and yet we're talking about the human being known as Messiah, Yeshua, well then, this human being has somehow transcended everything that it means to be human that we're aware of. For instance, um, I'm fully human. Last time I checked, I'm fully human. I'm truly human. I'm not quasi-human. I'm not a meta-human, at least not yet, right? And I'm not a mutant. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not an X-Man. Uh, I'm not an, an eternal, all right? So uh, I'm not even an Avenger, right? Someone who's, who's fully human but has maybe special powers, right? You know, I'm not a, I'm not a super soldier like Steve uh, Rogers or Captain America or something like that. And I'm certainly not a god like Thor or any of those guys. Um, I'm not Superman. I'm, I'm human, last time I checked. So I have a spirit in me. I have a spirit in me. Whose spirit is it? It's... Ariel spirit. Yeah, you guessed it. It's the spirit of Ariel. But, you know, as clever as that spirit is, he can only be in one place at one time. And guess what? He's always in the same place at the same he's always in the same place all the time. Where is that? Yeah, he's always walking around in my skin suit. You know, lazy bum, doesn't do any work, but expects to get paid. No, seriously. I'm just like everyone else listening to my voice right now. We're all human beings but we're all spirit beings. Therefore, my spirit can't possess someone else. My words can um, maybe take up residency inside your, inside your mind, and I hope that you remember some of the things that I say that are important. Well, that's great. But my spirit can't live inside your body. But as I read through the Bible, and I read about our Messiah, Yeshua, our Lord sent his spirit to dwell inside of us. How does that work? Right? How can the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Messiah come to dwell within me? How can the Spirit of the human known as Jesus take up residency within me? That's what we're talking about. So I say in my uh, commentary, how else are we to make sense of passages that speak of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, and the person of the Holy Spirit himself. Notice the Trinity, right? Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, person of the Holy Spirit. They all come to dwell within the genuine believers to form the body of Messiah. How is this possible? Unless we understand the nature, the triune nature of this God that we serve. God the Father, fully God, fully Spirit. God the Son, fully God, truly God, truly human, yet sends his spirit to dwell in every believer. And then we've got the Holy Spirit himself, who's fully spirit. Last time I checked, he's non-corporeal, except in those few times when he did show up as something tangible that you could see or hear or experience with one of your other five senses. I'm talking about the two times that are recorded for us uh, in the uh, Bible. Um, once he showed up in the uh, looking like a dove or appearing as a dove uh, when, when John was baptizing Yeshua. And the other time in the book of Acts where he um, expressed himself as a mighty rushing wind and tongues of cloven fire that came to a light on the believers. Um, you know, that was, that was the Holy Spirit as well. Uh, I, that's what we were saying, like a theophany of the Holy Spirit. But other than that, um, I don't have any passages where the Holy Spirit shows up looking like a man, as far as I can, as far as I can remember. Um, no, no descriptions there. Uh, Jesus is a human. Yeah, he looks like a man. And God himself, we read about theophanies in the Old Testament all the time, right? God shows up looking like an angel or like a man or a, 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 a burning bush or something like that. But when we're talking about um, the spirit of Messiah, we've got these questions that we don't always have the answers to. Let's keep reading my commentary. So we're going to have to take a look at the references in paragraph point number three below in time. And we will get to that in time uh, where Paul is talking about the spirit of God, spirit of Messiah, Holy Spirit, things like that. I go into question in my commentary. And I, when I say question, I'm not 
questioning for, because I don't believe it or that it's incredible. It's too too difficult to believe. That's not why I'm questioning. I'm questioning for the sake of challenging us to stretch our understanding and bring us to a place where we can better understand the, the Bible by asking questions of the text. How is this possible for um, this description of the Holy Spirit's activity within each and every believer and it being the Spirit of Messiah? Now, we would obviously assume that for God, this would be no problem, or for the Holy Spirit, this would be no problem, right? Spirits are incorporeal. They don't have re- restrictions, limitations. They can go everywhere. They can be every place at the same time. But Jesus is a man. How can he be at every place at the same time? How is this possible if, according to the skeptics, only God himself possesses the quality of omnipresence? Uh, let's see how far I want to go down. Uh, let, me, let me finish this um, uh, paragraph, and then we'll call it quits tonight. Doubters and disbelievers must answer the question of exactly how the, quote, spirit of the now risen Jesus, end quote, can come to live inside of every believer simultaneously if this very same Jesus was merely a human being. Whenever I read through Unitarian documents, Jesus is a glorified man. Glorified in the sense that he's been deified by God the Father to receive power and worship and, and, and uh, praise and adoration. Uh, he's been um, empowered by God to sit at the right hand of God and intercede for man and things like that. But I don't hear how they explain how the Spirit... Now, Jesus' own spirit can now suddenly live inside every believer simultaneously. Um, in other words, he's got he Jesus has powers of omnipresence, like uh, 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 like God the Father possesses. Um, the arguments are pretty weak unless you really uh, just accept the, what the Bible teaches, which is that Yeshua is full deity. I say in my commentary, I submit to you. And really, I'm talking to the skeptics. I submit to you that using language that may often appear to be ambiguous, viz. equivocal, right? Remember, we've got all these places in the Bible where sometimes the language can go either way until we have further context. I submit to you that without the context of the scriptures as a whole, emphasis on the word whole there, without the scriptures as a whole, the word of God, in point of fact, reveals to us a God who is complex in his nature, who exists eternally as one what and three who's, following along with me so far, and that in mystery and in majesty comes to dwell within true believers as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit harmoniously as one and yet uniquely as three all at the same time. Am I saying that we've got three spirits living inside of us? Absolutely not. Don't misunderstand me. Don't misquote me. Don't um, try to put words in my mouth that I'm not using. There are not three spirits living inside of us. We do not have the spirit of the Father, the spirit of the Son, and the spirit of the holy living inside of us so as to say, i got three spirits floating around in me. Right? That's a mess. No. What we have is one God who is unified in his complexity, but nevertheless reveals himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all at the same time, simultaneously. And yet it's not just one God wearing three masks or parading or masquerading, uh, playing three different actors, yet it's it's one uh, person. That's not what's going on either. In other words, we reject the, the ditch. Remember these heresies that we try to avoid? I'll put a little graphic on the screen for you guys. We avoid the ditch known as heresy on one side, the heresy known as modalism on one side that teaches there's simply one God who wears three masks, swapping them out whenever it's convenient for him to interact with humans. That's a, the heresy of modalism. We reject that as Trinitarians. And at the same time, there's a ditch on the other side of the road that we avoid known as tritheism or tritheism where we worship and recognize three separate gods, incohesive of one another. They don't really connect with one another. They're separate and distinct, and they're so separated and distinct and uh, that uh, there's no overlap, and thus it is three unique gods. We don't, we don't recognize that heresy either. We avoid both of those ditches. So that'll do it for our study uh, tonight on uh, exploring the Shema discussions on the issues of Trinity. We'll pick this up next week and continue looking at uh, this one 
God, and yet uh, the descriptions in the Bible of Spirit of God, Spirit of Messiah, and Spirit of the Holy, or Holy Spirit. Let's turn to our liturgy and begin to wind down our study tonight. I'm just going to read, um, uh, I think I will read uh, one set of passages and kind of draw this out since we're uh, uh, waxing long. Um, I'll read the liturgy, then I'll play the video, and then um, we'll dismiss in prayer. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 34, starting verse 10 and reading down through verse 12. We read the English a few weeks ago. Maybe it might have been last week or even two weeks ago. During our Simchat Torah ceremonies, rejoicing in the law, rejoicing in the giving of the Torah, uh, rejoicing over the Torah, which is part of the uh, Shemini Atzeret ceremony, the eighth day of Sukkot celebration that the Bible commands us to um, uh, celebrate. We normally in Jewish circles read the last few verses of the book of Deuteronomy and then turn our Torah scroll over and read the first few verses in the book of Genesis to create a seamless cycle between the two books so we can create the illusion of cycling the Torah over and over again without stopping. That's why we read them back to back. And so I read the um, English of Deuteronomy 34, 10 through 12 uh, uh, last week. Um, I think I'll read just the uh, the Hebrew tonight, and then next week I'll read the Genesis passage and the uh, Ephesians passage, and I'll just string it out. I'm not going to actually tie it all together. Maybe at the very end I'll read all of the passages together, and we'll make it kind of a little longer liturgy. But just for tonight, real quick, let me just whet your appetite and read the Deuteronomy passage. As you can see on my screen, right side of the page, that's the Masoretic Hebrew right there. Let's just start in verse 10. Um, you can see the English over on the left. If you want to read that on your own, that's ESV, but I'm not going to read that. I'll just read the uh, Hebrew on the right. The Hebrew says, V'lo kam navi od b'Yisrael k'moshe asher yad'o Adonai panim el panim. Verse 11 says, L'chol ha'otod v'ha'muftim asher shlacho Adonai la'asod b'eretz mitzrayim l'faro ul'chol avodai v'ul'chol aritzo. And verse 12 says, Ulchol hayad ha chazaka, ulchol hamora ha gadol asherasa, moshe leene kol yisrael. And that'll do it for our liturgy for tonight. Let's watch the short little video. After we watch the video, we'll simply dismiss in prayer. You ready? Here we go. Short questions, short answers by Tor Teacher Ariel and E Bible. Copyright Tate Say Tor Ministries 2015. All rights reserved. All right, let's turn to our first Sabbath question tonight. Question What day is the Sabbath day? Saturday or Sunday? And do Christians have to observe the Sabbath day? So it's a two part question. All right. Let me read a verse to put us in the creation mindset. Uh, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. We read this in my liturgy, but I'll read it again for the video. Okay. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And the third verse, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it, he had rested from all his work which God created and made. And of course that's Genesis 2 uh, verses 1 through 3 as rendered out of the ESV and we read that in our liturgy earlier. We're going to read those verses again a bit later in Hebrew but for now sit back and enjoy the creation themed slideshow video. And uh, that's what it is. It's basically a slideshow and it's themed off of what is this guy? Did anyone bring some popcorn? Hey get out of there guy. <laughs> Alright. All right, I, I want to answer the questions actually in reverse order of how they were asked, right? Actually, the reverse of how they were asked. So let's look at the questions here. Question, do Christians have to observe the Sabbath day? Answer, as covenant-bound believers in Yeshua Jesus and bona fide members in Israel, yes, the Torah applies to them. They should be observing the God-given seventh-day Sabbath instead of 
or better yet, along with the man-made replacement called Sunday. Question, what day is the Sabbath, Saturday or Sunday? Uh, answer, Sabbath is Saturday, despite its age. If we are to take God's word as trustworthy in its original autograph, then we can be sure. What can we be sure about? We can be sure that the biblical Sabbath has been preserved as our modern seventh-day Saturday based on at least 3,500 years of reliable records keeping. That's right, the Jewish people have been keeping these records for quite a long time. And based on an accurate historical grammatical understanding of the ancient Near Eastern tradition as a whole. In a word, you can trust the history of the Jews uh, that God entrusted us with. According to Old Testament Hebrew reckoning from time immemorial, and in keeping with ancient and Jewish practices, the days of the week are not named, but instead are merely numbered, the Sabbath day being the only exception. In other words, in, in, in Judaism, instead of having days of the week, we simply say day, uh, day one, day two, day three, etc. When no later than the second century, the Roman government decided to give days of the week names, surprisingly, our modern English named Saturday survived as the only day that retains its original connection to ancient Roman mythology. The other day's uh, modern names find their roots in Germanic polytheism. So that's true of many languages. Sabbath day still re is related to the Hebrew word for Sabbath. God established the universal seven-day weekly cycle in Genesis chapter 1. The same God entrusted Moses with transmitting this information to greater Israel and eventually to her written Torah, which is the law of uh, the first five books that we have. This same Torah was verified as accurate for 1,500 years of Jewish history until the time that Jesus Christ walked the earth. When he showed up 1,500 years later, he didn't seem to have to say, oh, you've got an inaccurate Torah. Within a few hundred years, the emerging Christian church picked up and continued this accurate transmission of truth right down to this very day. So are you following the logic so far of, of the accuracy? While not entirely accurate all the time, but nevertheless helpful, Wikipedia has this to say about the weekdays as being numbered from Saturday. Here's what Wikipedia has to say. Quote, For the majority of the Abrahamic religions, the first day of the week is Sunday, biblical Sabbath originally corresponding to Saturday. When God rested from six-day creation, made the day following Sabbath the first day of the week corresponding to Sunday. Seventh-day Sabbaths were sanctified for celebration and for rest. Wikipedia continues, After the week was adopted in early Christian Europe, Sunday remained the first day of the week, but also gradually displaced Saturday as a day of celebration and rest, being considered the Lord's Day. The change of Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday has no biblical foundations. All right, um... An additional article from Wikipedia on Saturday has this on record, quote, In Jewish law, Saturday is the seventh day of the week, called Shabbat. Thus, in many languages, the Saturday is named after the Sabbath. And you'll find that if you look that up in many languages. Roman, Catholic, and Eastern Orthodox churches distinguish between Saturday, Sabbath, and the Lord's Day, Sunday. Some Protestants call Sunday the Sabbath. See Sabbath in Christianity from their article there. And then they conclude, I think, by saying Quakers traditionally refer the Sabbath or Saturday as seventh day, eschewing or uh, avoiding the pagan origin of the name. In Islamic countries, Fridays are holidays, but they are considered as the sixth day of the week. So basically, we've got a lot of um, agreement on which days are. So what are our conclusions? Let me read that verse in Hebrew for us again. Vayichul hashami v'ha'aretz vayichol sva'am vayichol elohim bayom hashvi'i melakto asher rasa vayishbot bayom hashvi'i mekod melakto asher rasa And we read that in the liturgy, and those of you who follow along with my um, YouTube channel didn't catch the liturgy. It's it's exclusive to the uh, the audio version of iTunes, but this is the verse that I read. It's about how thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day God finished his work <clears throat> that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. That's uh, Genesis 2, 1 and 2. And there was one more verse here that I want to tag along to that, which is verse 3, uh, which reads... Um, 
I guess I didn't include it on my slide, sorry about that. Despite the obvious religious differences between Judaism and Christianity, both institutions do in fact agree that the Old Testament scriptures are reliable, they're accurate, and trustworthy in their original autographs, and this includes the Seventh-day Sabbath identity. So basically, between Judaism, Christianity, and we can even throw in Islam there, all of us agree which day is Seventh-day Sabbath. Amen? Amen. My podcasts are available on iTunes. Search for me under the name Ariel Hanavi. And uh, for those of you who prefer watching your teachings, well then uh, catch me out on YouTube. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, and I promise you that I upload content, new content, every week. In fact, it's multiple times a week that you're going to find new content there, okay? All right. And that'll do it for our short little video for tonight. Let's close in prayer. Ab, I bless your name. I'm so blessed to be a part of a of an online community that meets together week after week where we can study your words, where we can pray together, uh, pray for one another, where we can fellowship together by the power of the Holy Spirit, where we can uh, have some just some dialogue, some laughs, some crying. Um, Lord, even though there's a pandemic going on, we can still meet using this particular um, medium, and it's safe. And, uh, and it's effective. And so uh, I pray that you'll continue to strengthen us in this capacity. Bless those who couldn't make it tonight but wanted to be here, those who were with us in spirit, those who are joining us by way of YouTube or iTunes uh, later on after the fact. Bless them as well. Protect them, keep them safe, and raise them up. Give us a voice in this very dark world. Help us to see through all the nonsense. Help us to keep our eyes focused on Jesus, our Messiah, and help us to uh, keep striving towards the goal. We want to be holy. We want to be righteous. We want to turn away from sin. We don't want to be usable. We want our vessels to be used by the Master. Help us to be in that place where we are walking on the power of the Holy Spirit, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, turning away from sin and putting on the arm of God so that we can be effective witnesses to people around us. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory, Bashem Yeshua. Amen. That concludes our show for today. It is my desire that this continuing series of teachings will assist the average non-Jewish believer or new Messianic Jewish believer in his desire to become a more mature child of God. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your forefathers and loved them. And he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. Because the Torah is written on the hearts of all who truly name the name of Yeshua as Lord and Savior, it is meant to be followed to the best of our ability. We have no reason for fear of condemnation or the trappings of legalism. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. The intro and outro song were written, produced, and performed by Ryan Kingsley. For more information on contacting Ryan, you can reach me by email at yeshua613 at hotmail.com. That's Y E S H U A number 613 at hotmail.com. Or visit our website at graftedin.com. That's graftedin.com. 